utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and the talk and talk of your power. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless the reading of his word into our heart in Jesus' name. Maybe I should just read from Psalm 1 over, just one verse from Psalm 104, right? And we just go from there and see how the Lord will help us tonight. Psalm 104, right? And uh, right. Yes. Let's open to Psalm 104 quickly. Psalm 104. And maybe I should just read one or two verses there. I would have loved us to to read the old, the old, uh, the old chapter, Psalm 104, right? Okay, I'll read from verse 28. Uh, Well, maybe I should, to give a context, maybe I'll read from verse 24. Oh Lord, how manifold are your works, in wisdom you made them whole. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. There are are the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, (laughs) that you may give them their food in due season. Verse 28 says, What you give them, they gather him. You open your hand and they are filled with good. May the Lord bless the reading of his word into our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. By the grace of God, we are laying a foundation tonight, which I believe that God will be, you know, uh, helping us to uh, build on this weekend. A foundation, our Father in the Lord, my Father in the Lord is coming up tomorrow by the grace of God, and I'm sure that, you know, uh, it will just, God will just help me to, <laughs> to lay a good foundation tonight, amen, for him. Now, Romans chapter 1 verse 20, as Daddy said earlier, now the Bible says there that since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes are clearly seen, b- being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, my emphasis from that scripture is the fact that God always uses things that you and I can understand, you know, to explain the invisible things that we cannot see, right? He uses the things that you and I can understand to explain the spiritual things that he wants to pass across to us. So in Bible, there are so many things that God, you know, you see about the descriptions of God, you know, in scriptures, that are not necessarily, you know, uh, literally, they don't mean what they, what they say in a sense. Let me put it that way. Now, you, you talk about the eyes of God. Now, God is not a man. <laughs> he doesn't have eyes like human beings, right? But you see, you and I understand the function of the eyes. And that's why God, through the scripture, uses the eyes of God, you know, to explain to us that God sees. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, God is not a man. God is not a man. Now, another scripture, another phrase we see in scripture that God uses, I mean, the word of God uses to describe God or the works of God or uh, a part or an attribute of God is that phrase where we, which we are considering this weekend, and it is the hand of God. 
is the hand of God, right? Is the hand of God. Now, this weekend is about the open hand of God. Now, the hand, that doesn't mean, like Daddy said earlier, that God literally has God hand like mine. No, no. But you see, at times, even in our own expression, when you say to someone, I can see your hand, it can mean two things, right? It means I, I, I may see it literally, or <laughs> you have done something, amen? Uh, <laughs> there are people who have done something, I, I see your hand there, right? Now, and now, there are things that happen in our life that you know that this is God's hand. This is the hand of God. You are not, you are not seeing the hand literally, but by virtue of the things that has happened, you know that definitely God is there. This is the hand of God. So hand, let me say, is a symbol of strength. The hand is a symbol of strength. The hand is a symbol of power. The hand is a symbol of might. It's a symbol of ability. It's a symbol of ability. It's a symbol of what we can do, what we can do. Right, so when we see through scripture, the Bible talking about the hand of God, most of the time it's making reference to what God can do or what God has done, right? The power of God. <clears throat> it's making reference to the strength, the power of God, right? And that's how you see it being used in the scripture. Now, by way of introduction, let me say that there are many things that the Bible says about the hand of God. Uh, Daddy has already mentioned a few of them. But by way of introduction, I want to just mention a few of the things that the Bible and Scripture say about the hand of God. And that will be the foundation, you know, that I will lay before moving in to sharing on the open hand of God. There are several things, several descriptions of God's hand in the Bible. The first thing I want to share quickly about the description of God's hand in the Bible is that the Bible describes God's hand as a righteous hand. The Bible describes the hand of God as a righteous hand. To, right, to be righteous means to do what is right. Amen. In other words, God's hand does what is right all the time. God never do wrong. Hallelujah. And he can never miss it. He can never miss it because his hand is righteous. How do I know that? Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. The Bible says there, God speaking there, he says, so do not, be, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed from your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. He said, I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. So the hand of God is a righteous hand. The hand of God can be dependent on. It's a dependable hand. It's a hand that will lead us to our destination. He can't miss it. He can't miss it. He can't miss it. He can never miss it. It is a hand that is able to keep us steady on the best pathway in our life. It's the hand that is able to keep us in the right track for our life. It's the hand that is able to keep us in the best pathway, hallelujah, for our life. You know Psalm 32 verse 8, it says that the Lord will guide us in the best pathway for our life. Let me say this, there are so many ways in life. But there's a way that is the best for you. There's a way that is best for me. And it is the righteous hand of the Lord that is able to lead you and high in the best pathway for our life. How many of you understand what I've said so far? Hallelujah. Say glory to Jesus. Now, that's the first thing I see in Scripture. So the Bible describes the hand of God as a righteous right hand. As a righteous hand. As a righteous hand. Let me say this. That hand can never fail us. You can hold on to it. You can rely upon it. You and I can rely upon it. No matter the, the dream that God has given you, no matter the vision that God has put in your hand, that hand is able to help you guide our steps to see those dreams and vision become reality. It's a righteous hand. It's a righteous hand. It's a righteous hand. That's the first thing. The second thing, quickly, that I see in Scripture about the hand of God that the Bible says about the hand of God is that it is a strong and mighty hand. It is a strong and a mighty hand. Psalm 136 verse 12. The Bible says there, it says, With a mighty hand and outstretched arm is love endures forever. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. 
Let me say this. The hand of God is mighty. <laughs> the hand of God is strong. The hand of the God is mighty. Thank God you can see my own hand. But the hand of God. Let me give you what the Bible describes this hand as. Let me read, let's read Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 quickly. Right? Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12. When I read this, I said, wow. See the great hand of God. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12. He said, who has measured the waters in the whole of his hand? Oh, glory to Jesus. He said, who has measured the waters? You can imagine, uh, <laughs> even if our time we can't measure. Amen? Not to cut up. But the Bible says all the waters of the earth, God measures them in his hand. That's the mighty hand. That's the mighty hand. It is a mighty hand. He said, who has measured the waters in the whole of his hand? All with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens. Marked off the heavens. We didn't, we didn't read Psalm 104, but I love it. He said there, he said God commanded the mountain, you know, the valley. He said he set the limit for every one of them. That's the mighty hand of God. Who has measured, marked out the heavens with the breath of his hand? In other words, the heavens, right, to God is like this. He marked it out. Mighty hand. Mighty hand. is a strong and a mighty hand. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It tells us to humble ourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift us up in this season. God's hand is so mighty. Let me say this. There is nothing, there is no situation, no circumstance of life that God's mighty hand cannot lift us out of. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. And let me tell you something. When he wants to do it, he can do it within a twinkle, you know, within, he, he doesn't need years. He doesn't need, he can turn it around in a moment because his hand is mighty. He has shown it in scripture. We've seen it in our own days. An example is a man called Joseph in scripture. Maybe many of us might know his story. But the mighty hand of God, mighty hand of God brought him from prison to glory on that one night, one day, one day, one day. Let me say this, this year. As the daddy has declared, let me say this. Every one of us, we will see the mighty hand of God working in our behalf in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. It's a mighty hand. At times, one of our challenges is that we have made God too small in our sight. You know, and that's why I love that song. I have made you too small in my sight, O oh Lord. Forgive me. You know, at times, we think God is like us. No, not at all. Not at all. He's far greater than what we can think or imagine. The Bible says no one has seen him and lived. Hallelujah. He's so great. He told that he, he intentionally revealed himself to Christ Jesus so that we don't begin to raise, you know, idols and worship idols that look like him, create things that look like him. He's the mighty God. He's a mighty God. His hand is strong. His hand is mighty. Number three, quickly. Not only is the hand of God mighty, that hand of God does mighty and wonderful things. He does mighty things. He does wonderful things. He does mighty things. He does marvelous things. I love the prayer we prayed earlier. You know, marvelous things, wonderful things, mighty things, the hand of the Lord does. Psalm 18, verse 16, it says, The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Mighty things. Mighty things. In my own life, I've seen the hand of God do mighty things. Mighty things. As we are seated, up, seated here, you know, we have different testimonies of God's hand doing mighty things in our life. Mighty things in our life. There are some of us, you know, where we are today is only God. It's only God. It's only God. How will I have been here? It's not possible. It's not possible. My dad was a civil servant. My mom, civil servant. If I combine that, in fact, when I look at their... I, was, I always think, how did you people, how were you able to raise us up? How were you? 
but the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God is able to lift us, you know, from where he does mighty things in our life. He does wonderful things in our life. He does glorious things in our life. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. He said, wealth and honor comes from you. He said, you are the ruler of all things. In your hands and strength, a strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. He does mighty things. He does mighty things. Mighty things. Creation, you know, tells of his greatness. Mighty things. When you look at it, science is still exploring. <laughs> Hallelujah. The mighty works of God is still incomprehensible. Every day, people are getting professor upon professor upon professor. They have not been able to, to, to find out God does mighty things. Brethren, the hand of God. That's another thing I see in Scripture about the hand of God. Number four, quickly. I'll just share five, and the fifth one will be on the theme. Another thing I see about the hand of God in Scripture, quickly, is that the hand of God created all things. The hand of God created all things. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We are the work of your hand. The hand of God created everything. Job chapter 12, verse 10. He said, in his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. In his hand. In his hand. In his hand. And that's why it's important for us to always acknowledge the hand of God. Right? The Bible says in his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And the breath of all mankind. <laughs> in his hand. In our home, whenever we want to do anything, we say it's by God's grace. You know, it's by God's grace. Because we know that everything we have and everything we are going to be doing is by his hand. It's by his help. It's by God's grace. We have said it to the extent that our last born believed that God's grace is something in the future. Amen? Because when you say, oh, uh, uh, okay, should we do this? I'll say by God's grace. You know, so she, uh, she thinks that by God's grace, right? When you say to her, and I said, daddy, no, now. Uh, by God, not by God's grace. <laughs> She's only a three-year-old. Right? She said, no, no, not by God's grace. I said, no, you don't know the meaning of my God. <laughs> Because when you say, Dad, let's go out. Okay, we'll go out by God's grace later. You know, you know why you just said that? So she, she came to believe that by God's grace is something in the future, right? <laughs> but it's not something in the future. The hand of God created everything. The hand of the Lord created everything. Psalm 95, verse 5. He said, the sea is ease, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. The hands of God. He formed everything. Right? Isaiah 48, 13, God speaking there. He said, my own hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread the heavens. He said, when I summon them, they all stand up together. <laughs> when I summon them, they stand up together. The earth, there is nothing that God cannot summon. Because his hand made it. His hand made it. A day, a day came, we read in scripture, that a storm arose, right? And Jesus was there with his disciples. The Bible says, he, he just said, peace be still. And they were wondering, what, man, what manner of man is this? Who can do that? It's because he's in his hand. He, did, he created, the, even the storm, he, he created it. So everything obeys it. And that's why I know anything in your life, <laughs> Everything must obey God. Uh -huh. There is nothing in our life that the hand of the Lord is not able to turn around. Uh -uh. He created everything. He created everything. Another dimension of God created, creating everything is the fact that now all that you and I need are in his hands. All that you and I need are where? 
in his hands. In his hands. In his hands. Everything you and I will need for life is in his hands. Is in his hands. Is in his hands. Everything. Everything that you need for life. Everything that I need for life. They are in his hands. Psalm 95 verse 4. In his hands are the depth of the earth. The mountain peaks belong to him. There is not one thing that you and I require for life that is not in his hand. That is not in his hand. That's the fourth thing, quickly. Now, let's move forward. Everything is in his hand. Everything is in his hand. Everything is in his hand. The fifth thing, quickly, is that that same hand, you know what? The Bible says that God opens it to release his blessing. God opens it to release his provision. God opens it. As Daddy said earlier, the phrase open hand talks about the generosity of God. The generosity of God. Psalm 1, around 4, verse 28. He said, when you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied. Why are they satisfied? Because everything is there. All that they need is there. When God, op- well, we'll come back to that. Is everything is there. Psalm 1, around 45, verse 16. He said, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You open it and you satisfy it. Now, let's zero on that scripture a bit. Psalm 145, verse 16. To open means to allow access to something. To open means to remove restraint. To open means to remove every limit. To open means not to hold back. It means to release. It means to release. The open hand of God connotes access to what is in his hand. And everything that you and I need for life, where is it? In his hand. Access is a release of God. It's a release of God's abundant provision. Everything that you and I need for life. That's what it means to open God, for God to open his hand. The Bible says that he opens his hand and he satisfies the desire of all living things. Let me read that scripture to us in a few translations, a few different translations. Psalm 145, verse 16. I love this one. This, the, the amplified AMPC. You open your hand, it says, and satisfy every living thing with favor. With favor. You open your hand and satisfy every living thing with favor. The Passion Translation says this. He said, when you open your generous hand, it's full of blessing, satisfying the longing of every living thing. It's full of blessing, satisfying the longing of every living thing. Brethren, whenever God opens his hand, there's always satisfaction. There's always satisfaction. And to satisfy simply means to fulfill the desires, to meet the expectation, to meet the needs, to meet the demands, to give someone what they want or what they need. To satisfy means to give full contentment to. Let me say this. God can so much bless us 
that you and I come to that state where we are contented. We are satisfied. And I believe that that's the purpose of God, the plan of God for us as we begin this journey in this new year. God is opening up his hand. He's removing every limit. We prayed that prayer earlier, that every unbelief, because there are things that might want to limit our access to the open hand of God. But those limits are removed tonight in Jesus' name. So that scripture says that God opens his hand and satisfies the desire of all living. Let me dwell on the words desire one moment and just talk about that. That you already, you know, that's why I said it's pre December. <laughs> Amen. Right? Because desire is, all, is very important for us to understand what the scripture is saying. There are two aspects to, that I see in everyone's desire. There are two aspects, and I will share briefly on them before we move forward. forward. The first thing about what, that I see about our desire is that there is an aspect of our desire that is based on what is needed. What is needed. You and I, there are things that we need. And we have desires so that those needs are met in our life. What we need. So that's the first aspect that I see about desire. People desire, think, you know, you desire that you won't go hungry. No, that's a legitimate desire. That there's food on the table. That there's clothes for us to wear. That there's shelter over our head. Those are legitimate desires. So the first aspect of desire is what I call the needs. But we thank God. The scripture says, and my God <laughs> shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let me say this. God cares about us. Cares about those legitimate desires that you and I have. He cares about them. Psalm 37 verse 25. He said, I have been young. Now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Why? Because God cares for them. He meets their need. He satisfies their desires. He satisfies their desires. God delivered Israel from the land of Egypt, bondage, sir, throughout the wilderness. Despite the fact that it was a journey through the wilderness, he satisfied their desires. He provided food for them. When they complain that there is no meat, it caused meat to fall from heaven. They had clothing on them. They were not naked in the journey, despite the fact that it was in the wilderness. The Bible says that their shoes did not grow old. God satisfied their desires. Needs. Brethren, whether we like it or not, there are legitimate needs in our life. And God cares. One thing God doesn't want us to do about the needs in our life is to worry about them. He doesn't want us to worry as children of God. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus told us categorically that God is committed to meeting our needs. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go to work, ne you know, next week. And say, pastor said, you know, God is committed. Let me sleep a bit more. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. That's not what I'm saying. Amen. I, do you understand what I'm saying? Right? But God is committed to meeting our needs. And let me say this. It's not the job. It's God. Because the job comes from him. You see that? The job comes from him. So God is committed to meeting every need in our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, Jesus instructed us not to worry about the needs of life. He said, for our heavenly Father knows that we need all of these things. Clothing, food, shelter, they are legitimate needs which God is aware of and committed to supplying in our lives. It's so important for us to understand that. 
So that's the first aspect of desire. God says we should stick forth his kingdom and his righteousness. He said all these other things shall be added unto us. Needs. God said I'm committed to meeting it. In fact, Jesus gave the example. He said look at the boss of the hair. He said God fits them. God fits them. If he fits the body of the hair, he said, how much more you? Will he not feed us? He will. God is committed to that. So the Bible says he opens his hand and he satisfies the desires of all living. Part, one aspect of that desire is what is called needs. He satisfies it. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children beg for bread. Why? God is always there for them. No matter how difficult. That doesn't mean that there could not be moments of our life where things are difficult, tough and challenging at times. But in the midst of it all, there will always be a way. Has there been a way? There will always be a way. Why? God is committed. He's committed. Now, another aspect of our desire, and that you touched briefly on that, is not just need. It's what we want. And that is where the robber most of the time misses the road. Because what we want may not necessarily be aligned with the will of God. What we want. But thank God, for I love the way Daddy presented it. He said, God will first of all heal our desire. Then he will satisfy them. He will heal it. The, the, the scripture says in Psalm 37 verse 4, he said, delight yourself in the Lord. And it will grant unto you the desires of your heart, including those things that you want. (laughs) Those things that you want for the fulfillment of God's call upon your life. These are not food and clothing. No. Those things that you want. Those things that you are praying for. God, bring this into my life. For the fulfillment of his call. For the fulfillment of his purpose for our life. There are things that you and I want. As we are all seated there today, our faces differ. Our wants differ. Our wants differ. But let me say this. It's important for us to delight ourselves in the Lord continually. The Bible says if we do that, it will grant unto us the desire of our life. At times, as ministers, we want the anointing. But God is saying, character first character first. So he's putting us through some certain situation where he's building character in us and training us because he, by the time he releases the anointing, (laughs) right, he wants us to have character to be able to carry the anointing. Delight yourself in the Lord. Brethren, it's good to desire the anointing, but let me say this. Without character, I tell you, we'll be a shipwreck. Character first. God is saying character first. There are people who desire, thank God, is a need. Shelter is a need. <laughs> but you see, there are people who desire, I don't know what your desire, maybe an estate or whatever it is. <laughs> and God is saying, let me build you up first. Right? In my own little experience with God, I've come to discover that there is nothing I need that is not in the hand of God. However, let me say this. The Bible says that in his time, he makes all things beautiful. There is a timing for everything in our life. But I know that this year we are entering into is a season of harvest for some of us. In the name of Jesus Christ. The seed sown in the years past will bear their fruit. In the name of Jesus Christ. It's so important for us. Wants. So it's, as we walk with God, our wants become aligned with his will. Even when you have the ability to do something, God has put all the money or resources in your hand, not just money. You still want to please him. You still seek his face to say, God, what should I go for? That's when God can trust us. He can trust us. The fact that we have something at times doesn't mean that we should go for it. 
we have the resources, we have the well-being, we have the where we are to be able to, to, to go for it. At times in our spirit, the spirit of God is saying to us, it's not your time. It's not your time. And a lot of people at times, we have missed it. We have hastily gotten some inheritances. And that's why the, the end has not been blessed. The Bible says an inheritance, Proverbs 20, 21. An inheritance may hastily be gotten at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. What am I saying? Everything we need is in his hand. But at times, there is a timing. There's a timing. There was a timing for the Israelites to walk through the wilderness. It was a timing of their life. But when that journey ended, they went into a land which is flowing with milk and honey. And the provisions of God in the wilderness was different. The manifestation of the open hand of God over their life was different. It was different. It's so important for us to understand that. First Timothy, Paul was admonishing Timothy. He said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not trust in uncertain riches, but the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He said, let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, strong, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. He said, God has given us all things, richly all things to enjoy, but there is a timing for it. There's a timing for it. Therefore, Isaiah 28, verse 16. Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believe will not act hastily. Will not act hastily. Because in the open and the open openness of God's hand, there's still timing, sir. There's timing. There's a time factor that you and I must not miss. Now, let's move forward quickly because of our time. Oh, time is gone. Whether it is a want or a need, what I discover is that the Bible says that God is able to satisfy them. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly, far above what we can think or imagine according to the power that works in us. So whether it's a desire, I mean, it's a need, whatever, or a want, a legitimate want, God is able to satisfy them. Now, let's move forward quickly because of our time. Why does God open his hand? Why does God allow us access into his provision. Why does God open his hand to bless us? And I will give us three things quickly because of our time. Number one is that God opens his hands to bless us so that we can access and enjoy the provision and blessing of God. We can enjoy them. You and I can enjoy them. 1 Timothy 1.17 that we read, it says God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Brethren, there's nothing wrong for believers to enjoy the blessings of God. Uh-huh. You see, there's nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong to enjoy. Don't feel bad that you are eating chicken. Amen? <laughs> it's the blessing of God. Amen. Because at times, the, you know, <laughs> someone was talking about someone, sir. They said, ah, that person is a very humble person. I said, why? He said, look at the car they drive. Ah, I said, no, they don't have money to change it. That's why they are driving that. That's not a sign of humility. Right? No, it's not a sign of humility at all. You can drive a rugged car and be proud. There are proud poor people. And they have remained poor because they are proud. You see that? But there are people who are rich and very humble. God can bless us. Everything you and I need is in his hand. Why does he open it? So that we can enjoy the blessings of God. Those things he's created is for our enjoyment. When he created the first man, Adam and Eve, he provided everything they needed, sir. He put them in the garden and gave them everything that they needed. They didn't lack anything. 
They didn't lack anything. So God opens his hands towards you and I so that you and I can have access to his provision and enjoy it. Enjoy it. Sleep well in your house. Enjoy it. Enjoy the provisions of God. Number two, quickly, because of our time. Why does God open his hand towards us? Another reason why God opens his hand towards us is that so that we can have what we need to fulfill his purpose for our life. Not just to enjoy it, but to have what we need to fulfill his purpose for our life. And I've come to realize that the purpose of God is for us to be blessed and for us to be a blessing. So God opens his hands towards you and I so that you and I can be blessed of God and we can be a blessing to others. We can be a blessing to others. He told, he told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. He said, and you will be a blessing to others. I love the way Daddy preached earlier. He said, through Jesus, we have an inheritance in Abraham. Hallelujah. We share in that blessing. So God opens his hand, so was you and I, so that we can be blessed and we can be a blessing to others. You and I can fulfill the purpose of God for our life. He opens his hand towards us. He gives us favor. We go places, he prepares the place ahead of us. We walk in unusual, uncommon favor. Favor of God. Favor of God. One area I've seen favor of God, more, you know, I, I've seen favor of God in several areas. But in my career, I've seen the favor of God. When they say favor of God, I've seen it, sir. I've seen it, sir. I've seen it, sir. Favor of God. God will just put it in people's heart and they'll be running around. We need to promote this guy. We need to promote this guy. You are, you are, and you are not doing anything. Is that not God? You tell me it's not God? It's God. It's God. It's God. I'll be foolish to say it's my intelligence. No, where? Very, very foolish to say that. It's God. It's God. But he blesses us so that we can fulfill his purpose. So that through us, others can be lifted. So that through your testimony, through your, where, wherever God has placed you, you can be a hand that will be a blessing to someone else. He po- opens his hand towards us. Number three. And this is the third one I will share before I begin to close. Because of time. Why does God open his hand towards us? The last thing I saw, I mean, this is the third thing that I saw in Scripture. God opens his hand towards us because blessing us sir, brings him pleasure. Oh, you didn't see that. It brings him pleasure, sir. It brings him pleasure. Blessing us is God's delight. Blessing us is God's delight. Releasing his provision into our life brings God pleasure. It brings God pleasure. Fulfilling the purpose of God for our life brings God's pleasure. So he opens his hand towards us so that you and I can bring him pleasure. In fact, when he does that, he's so happy. Look at that, Psalm 145, verse 16, that we read. He said, he open, and they are all satisfied. You know, our satisfaction is God's satisfaction. You know, it, 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 it brings him pleasure. How do I know this? Psalm 25, verse 27. He said, let them shout for joy and be glad. Who favor my righteous cause? Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of who? His servant. God takes pleasure in our prosperity. In our prosperity. Takes pleasure in our prosperity. It brings him pleasure. God's open hand brings prosperity. And our prosperity delights God. It delights God. That his children prosper. Oh, it brings him pleasure. It brings him pleasure. It brings him pleasure. Now, let me begin to close. How can I? I I just said it. I'm just introducing the topic tonight, you know, and we'll close and pray in a few moments. I think, but the last thing I will, the last question I'm going to ask tonight is that how can I consistently enjoy the open hand of God, the blessing of God's open hand over my life. Because, brethren, I don't know about you. I want to walk under God's open hand. 
I want to enjoy the blessing, the outpouring of God's blessing. I want to enjoy God's marvelous kindness. I want to enjoy God's generosity. I want that to be my daily experience. That's my desire. How can I consistently enjoy the blessing of God's open hand? Number one, I will share five things quickly, then we will pray. Number one, and this is from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. It says, we should be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Let me say this. It takes faith to access. That's why the fact that God's hand is open. It takes faith to access the things that are in God's hand. Faith. And that's why every, that prayer is a spot on prayer that everyone believes that God should uproot it from our heart. God should uproot it from our life. Faith. It takes faith. It takes, God's hands are open, but it takes faith to access the provisions of God that are in his hands. The question is, in whom is our confident trust? Hebrews 11 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Brethren, it takes faith. And that's why all through this year, Lord, let no seed of unbelief be in me. In the name of Jesus Christ. Help me to rise in faith. In every situation, in every circumstance. That nothing will be able to limit me from assessing the blessing of your open hand. It's so important. Pleasing God is so important. He said it takes, without faith, it is impossible to please God. <laughs> and when we don't please him, right, you can enjoy his open hand. Every living enjoys his open hand because they please him. The Bible says the trees of the field, they clap their hands in praise. The birds sing of his glory. Hallelujah. Everything they declare of his greatness, they tell of his greatness, tell of his marvelous works. Our life cannot be an exemption. We have to please him. We have to please him. Brethren, our prayer is, God, help me to please you. Help me to walk by faith and not by sight. Help me to please you in every situation, in every circumstance, every moment of my life. Help me to please you, Lord. Number two, because of time. How can I consistently enjoy the blessing of God's open hand? Number two. We have to walk uprightly and in the fear of the Lord. The first one is that we, have, we need to have faith. <laughs> but secondly, we need to walk uprightly. A commitment to righteous living is important. Psalm 84 verse 11. Thank God that Daddy read that earlier. He said, for the Lord is a son and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing we leave with old from those who walk out uprightly, uprightly. Brethren, there are doors that the righteousness will, will open for us this year. Uh, uh, it will open for us. In, it will just open it for us. You won't even need to knock it. But your righteous work with God will open it for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Is that no good thing we leave with old from those who walk uprightly? No good thing. No good thing. I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. Walking uprightly. Walking in the fear of the Lord. Number three. What do I need to do? Consistently enjoy God's open hand. Is that we need to seek his kingdom in all things. Matthew 6, 33. Jesus speaking there. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness is coming, you know, <laughs> again. But the first thing, we seek first the kingdom of God. He said, every other thing will be added to us. That's what that scripture is saying is that if we make kingdom our focus, he said, every other thing will be added. That's what he's saying. That doesn't mean, making kingdom our focus doesn't mean that you should come and sleep in church. Amen? No. But wherever we are, 
in whatever we do for God to be magnified, for God's kingdom to be our focus, our priority, to extend the kingdom of God wherever we are. Thank God for the vision of this ministry to raise agents of change. We need doctors who are kingdom-minded people. We need teachers who are kingdom-minded people. We need lawyers who are kingdom-minded people. In fact, we need artisans who are kingdom-minded people. We need people in all walks of life who are kingdom-minded. Brethren, not everybody is called to lead like Moses. But there are people who are called to be like Bazalia, who are to build according to God's pattern wherever they are, so that the glory of God can be seen wherever they are. And I pray that you and I will be like Basale. God said, I have called him, I have filled him with my spirit in all wisdom. He said, I will build according to the pattern that I have shown him. I believe that I'm a Basalian in my own generation. NHS needs Basalia. When you look at the, the curriculum, of the education curriculum nowadays, my, my, my daughter comes home and I said, did they teach you that? To make it worse, it was, in, in, it was in religious knowledge. And I was saying, is this religious knowledge or confusion? We need believers. Can be able to stand and say, that is not right. We need Christians in all walks of life. In government, we need believers. And I pray that God will raise agents of change. Amen. Who will occupy their place and bring the glory of God to wherever they are in the name of Jesus Christ. Number four, quickly, what do I need to do? This is another thing that God laid upon my heart. He said we need to be obedient. Obedient. And we need to serve the Lord. Job chapter 36, verse 11. He said if they obey and serve him, he said they will spread their days, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Obedience, simple obedience. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. God said, bring God the tithe into the store that there may be food in my house. He said, if you do that, he said, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that your, your room cannot contain. Brethren, there's a blessing of obedience. This year is not a year to joke with divine instruction. Stop calculating it, amen? Let's listen to what God is saying. We have missed it before. I remember, I, re I, I shared this with, with great, you know, with, with <laughs> I, I was in a service one day, and I heard him speak very clearly, whatever you give me today, I give you back a hundredfold. Ah! And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> hundredfold, I look at what is in my pocket. I begin to calculate it. Who will give me this kind of money? You see, I, I, brethren, we have to suspend our thinking and reasoning. We have to obey God. One of the, one of the problems, we, one of the challenges that many of us, uh, you know, have with connecting with God's open hand is that we overthink things. We overthink it. So I started calculating it. Where would this money come from? I visited my cousin in Lagos, <laughs> and I was thinking, if I'm leaving, what has he ever given me before? What will he give me now? I, I started calculating it, and I thought, okay, let me put a bit on top of what I think is reasonable, amen? But it doesn't have to be reasonable, sir. He opens his hand and satisfies the desires. There are things I've been praying for in my life, God do. But when the opportunity came, I messed it up. So by the time I was leaving Lagos that year, I can never forget in my life. I was just about to travel, and God said, open your, you know, check what you have been given. I checked it. It was exactly hundredfold of what I gave that day. I started weeping. I started crying. I started weeping. Ever since that day, I have asked for grace to do whatever God is telling me to do. Brethren, this year we are about to enter into, let me say this, some of us carry vision and dreams that our job can never get us to. It's not possible. They can't pay you for that vision. They can't pay you for that dream. But let me say, our obedience to divine instruction can get us there. 
it can open the hand of God over our life and pour out a blessing of God upon our life in a dimension that will baffle us, that will shock us. I'm, ready. I'm praying for that. I'm praying, God, forgive me, right? I have not had that again, you know, since that time. And I've keep praying, <laughs> right? I've not had that. What am I saying? It's important, obedience. If they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Obedience opens the hand of God. Obedience. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Present. Daddy was explaining earlier that you see, it takes an open hand to receive what is in his hand. At times, you don't want to let go of what you have in your hand. That's why you are not receiving anything new. But you and I need to be able to ask God for faith. Lord, help me. No matter how difficult it is, help me to be able to say yes to your demands upon my life. Help me, Lord. That's a prayer for me. I don't know whether it's your own prayer as well, but that's my own prayer tonight. Now, whatever faith demands of me, Lord, help me to be able to do. Lastly, as I close, what should I do? This is another thing that I believe God laid upon my heart to share. He said, be faithful in little. What do I need to do to enjoy God's open hand upon my life? The blessing of God's open hand. Be faithful in the little that God has given. Be faithful. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 to 11. Jesus said, he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful. Is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what is more. He said, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the righteous mammon, he said, who will commit to you the truth, who will commit to your trust true riches? Brethren, God wants us to bless us beyond our imagination. But we've got to be faithful. Faithful to what he has committed unto us. The assignment God has given to us, let's be faithful to it. In church, let's be faithful. At work, let's be faithful. Faithful in the little things. Faithful with the resources of God. Faithful. 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 God is saying, if we are faithful in that little, you know what? He's able to open his hand over our life and pour out his blessing. A blessing that you and I will come to that point that say, ah, I'm satisfied. The Bible says he opened up his hands and he satisfied the desire of every living. Let's rise up on our feet. He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living. Brethren, why does God open his hand? He does it because he wants you and I to enjoy his blessing. He does it so that you and I can have what we need to fulfill his purpose for our life. He does it because it brings him pleasure. What do I need that the hand of God will be consistently open over my life? I need faith. Go ahead and pray tonight and say, Father, increase my faith. Lord, help me. Help me. Go ahead and pray. Pray that prayer one more time. And say, Lord, help me. We need to walk uprightly. Ask God to help you to walk uprightly. In the name of Jesus Christ. Ask God to help you to make his kingdom your focus. Lord, help me, help me. In everything, Jesus, help me, help me to make your kingdom my focus.